The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, from TLC's Rattled, Allie and Josh Taylor share their story of growing their family while defeating cancer. Plus, a mother turns to meds. I remember wanting to take another one before I was supposed to. And unleashes the monster within. When you've walked it, you know what that monster looks like. Her story. I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop. On today's 700 Club. Welcome to the 700 Club. You've probably read about it, but it's there. Is discrimination in the digital age. Conservatives are being suspended, filtered, and banned across what's called social media. And now the White House is fighting back against big tech. Dale Hurd has that. Many conservatives feel like second-class citizens on social media. We're now simply posting conservative policies could get you in trouble. Facebook last week suspended conservative Candace Owens after she posted that liberal policies were harmful to the black family. Facing an outcry, Facebook claimed the suspension was a mistake. Twitter suspended Heritage Foundation media director Greg Scott for so-called hateful conduct. After simply tweeting to a transgender athlete the physical differences between men and women, conservative actor James Woods, with two million Twitter followers, left the platform altogether after Twitter suspended him for this tweet that quoted Ralph Waldo Emerson, author and radio host Eric Metaxas. We just have to say this is wrong. This is fundamentally un-American, and it must be addressed. It will undermine our voting process. It will undermine self-government. It's already doing that. When you control information, you control everything. A new study published by the left-wing Columbia Journalism Review confirmed that search giant Google skews heavily liberal in its search results. Only one conservative news source popped up in Google's top 20, Fox News. Dan Gaynor of the Media Research Center says no one should be surprised. Google is liberal. They set up rules that are liberal. They hire staff who are liberal. They, the staff give politically to liberal candidates. And then when you appeal, you have to talk to the liberal staff. And, you know, it, it's just sort of we're boxed in on all sides. A Project Veritas undercover investigation found the same anti-conservative attitudes at Twitter. Pretty sure every single employee at Twitter hates Trump. And when companies like Facebook start deciding who is allowed to have free speech, this First Amendment lawyer says we should all be concerned. Facebook gets content moderation wrong all the time. They take down speech that most reasonable people think shouldn't be taken down, and they leave up other speech that a lot of people think should be taken down. President Trump has taken notice, setting up an online tool for reporting censorship on social media. The White House has also refused to sign on to a new global compact to monitor online speech in what some call a worldwide attempt to censor conservatives. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Here to tell you more about the problem online censorship is Mark Weiner. He's the president of Strategic Media 21, a social media marketing company. And Mark, thanks for being with us. Glad to see you. Pat, thanks for having me on. All right. Who do you represent? Who are your clients? You've got a bunch of them. Well, we have a number of clients, uh, many of them who are social conservatives, many of them who are religious, and others are just in the secular arena. All right. Well, what's happened? You dealt with uh, Facebook and, and uh, Google. What are they doing to your clients? Well, what's interesting, they don't think they're being unfair or okay. discriminatory. They don't wake up in the morning saying, gee, we're anti-conservative. They wake up thinking things like there are 58 different genders, for example. That's one of their policies. So they just look at people who are religious and say, gee, you just have two genders. You must be discriminating against the other 56. So I don't think they're being unfair. What do you mean by 58 genders? What kind of, I thought there's only two, male and female. What, what, how'd you get 58 of them? Well, Pat, you're missing 56 of the genders. I hate to say this, so <laughs> yeah. sorry, sorry about that. I hate uh, to be so ill-informed. <laughs> what are the other 56? Well, one of the spokespeople said, gender is not binary, meaning it's yeah. a fallacy to think there are just two genders. Yeah. So what happens is if you have that opinion in America, that's, it's a free country, you can have that. The challenge now is that you have just two or three companies 
who control the social media. And if they then start saying you're being discriminatory if you think there are only two, that's where the problem starts. Well, uh, give me an example of one of your clients who's been discriminated against, will you? Well, this isn't specifically our client, but I'll give you an example okay. of Franklin Graham, who took a stand. He was yeah. banned from one of the platforms for a day for saying something which he had said two years before about a transgender bathroom bill. And in his case, he had the guts to come back after the day, and he reposted the same post along with an explanation of why he thought that was fair. But the challenge is that many people don't have that kind of fortitude to come back and keep fighting. Well, how do these algorithms work? I mean, Google is run by a bunch of geniuses. The guys who started it, Sergey Brin and others, they're, they're incredibly smart. What are these algorithms that keep people on and, and take them off? Yeah, Pat, an algorithm is just a fancy word for a computer program. That's it. That's, that's it. So it sounds, it sounds very sort of, you know, space age, but it's a computer program. What happens is that an average person may get, let's say, 100 or 200 people they're following. Each of them puts out a couple of posts a day. So you would think that you would get one or 200 pieces of content a day. Uh -huh. What the computer systems do is they pick maybe 20 or 30 of those pieces of content to give to you and they filter out the other 170. So you never even knew those other 170 were there. So the computer is controlling what you see. Well, again, uh, give me a, a, a specific, you talked about Franklin Graham, but you, I'm sure you've got some horror stories. You get, give me one of them, somebody, your client or somebody else's client. Well, for example, the one that was just mentioned online, Candace Owens, right. African-American, uh, made a statement that was then viewed as discriminatory and a they found a clip which showed that she's number 23 on the list of people that are viewed as potential hate speech people. So she was taken off for a week and she was simply expressing a point of view. If you or I read that statement, we wouldn't think there was anything there that was hateful. Uh, she's an African-American and she was deemed as having committed hate speech until she protested. And they took her off? They took her off. And the warning that's implicit is you better start speaking more mildly or not address certain topics, or this ban could become permanent. So about two weeks ago, they banned seven people permanently, and this is a lifetime ban, meaning you don't get to come back on, you don't get to repent or change your ways for saying certain things. Oh, who are some of them? Well, some of them are people that you or I might not agree with. Right. Uh, Alex Jones was one with the site Infowars. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some of the other people who were on there that again, Maybe you or I might not agree with everything they say, but you would think in a country that honors freedom of speech, they would still be allowed to say it, and then people can follow or not follow. Well, you know, in politics, for example, it would be terrible if, if a candidate's speech was being censored so that he couldn't reach the public. I mean, that would be a total denial of our democratic processes. Pat, it would, but we're getting very close to that. What happens is that people who are banned get the headlines. So you see, oh, this person was banned. But what the social media companies have is a far more subtle tool, which is they simply dial down the number of people who get your message. So you think you're sending your message to a million people. If they don't like the message. They'll send it to a much smaller number. And there's nothing you can do or control they, that. They have that authority. That they can just determine how many, how many people see your message. They can dial it down. Is that, that the way Abs it works? Absolutely. And they do this with individuals, too. They're not necessarily being discriminatory, but let's say you have 300 people that follow you, and you're a mom, and you send out a picture of your little baby daughter, mm -hmm. and 10 friends come back and say, isn't that daughter cute? You might think the other 290 don't think she's cute, yeah. but what actually happened is they never sent your message to 290 people, and you don't know. They don't tell you how many they send it to. Oh. You know, there needs to be legislation. I, I, I hate the government to get involved in anything, but it does seem like these organizations have grown too powerful. They really have, and they dominate. Uh, who would have thought that if something that began in a college dorm, Facebook, would become as powerful as it is? Oh, well, Pat, you're right. You know, 30 or 40 years ago, you might have had hundreds of TV stations and newspapers That's and right. radio stations. No one dominated. Now you have basically two or three companies started in Silicon Valley, where I'm from, mm -hmm. and they have absolute control, very little regulation, and 
you know, that's why you're seeing calls for regulation or breaking them up, because there's a lot of power concentrated in one place, even if they do things perfectly. Well, do you think there's going to be some move? I mean, you think, uh, of course, Trump is is coming out against what's being done. How about how about Congress? Congress is, well, the Democrats probably like it. Well, what's, what's actually interesting is you're getting pressure both from the left and from the right. So Elizabeth Warren and Joe Biden are coming out saying maybe break up these, you know, call them monopolies. Ted Cruz is calling for hearings. So you actually have a world where left and right maybe yeah. agreeing on something, which is there's too much power there. You know, I was working with uh, uh, one of the big firms out there on, on a project. And in those days, Google was just getting started. Nobody thought much of Google. I mean, here these kids were... Uh, out of Stanford coming up with these various things. It, it has grown so powerful in terms of, uh, of um, media. I mean, if, if, for example, our university, if we buy media, we always go to Google or some of these others to get our, our message out. It's very important. You, you have to. There's basically Google, Facebook, maybe Twitter. There are two or three places that control the media landscape and control what you and I see. And by control, it really is true. It, it, most people might get two or 300 pieces of content a day. They only get to see 20 or 30 of them. So there's enormous control there. What would you do if you, if you, it was a perfect world, you could control it. What would you do uh, if you were the Congress or the president? What, what, what would you recommend? Well, you need either competition to arise or you need to break up the monopolies or you need to have one set of rules which gives guidelines for fairness. And fairness would say that whether you're Pat Robertson or whether you're a liberal commentator, you both have the same right to say the same thing and have that enshrined in the law. And right now, there are none of those three things. What do you think, last question, what, what do you think the uh, impact they're going to have on the election? You know, Trump's guy used Facebook in a brilliant way to win the election for him. I mean, you know, he didn't spend a lot of money on paid media, but he had, uh, you know, manipulation of Facebook. Uh, what do you think is going to be done for this next election? Uh, Pat, it's anybody's guess. Yeah. It's anybody's guess. This last time around, Trump did a fabulous job on Facebook, and really? people blamed it, saying it was Russians. He just did a fabulous job. Yeah. This next time around, it may be a lot tougher for them to get their word out. We will have to see. But uh, you don't see any legislation or any action coming between now and then? The hard thing, as you know, is you've got a Democratic House and a Republican yeah. Senate, and getting those guys to all agree is <laughs> not going to be easy. All right. Well, Mark, thank you for being with us. Thank Appreciate you, Appreciate it very much. Ladies and gentlemen, you, you, if, if you're not, you know, a lot younger than I am, uh, you, you don't understand what's being done. But these young people particularly, that's the total source of their news. They don't watch television. And they're not even into streaming media and all this. They, they, they watch what's on the social media. That's how they get their news. And if it's being filtered and changed, the whole nation can be brought to a point. And we're going to talk later on this program about how many people in America favor socialism. Why? Because of this thing we're talking about. Appreciate our guest. Mark, thank you so much. Pat, thank you. God bless you. All right, Terry, what's next? Well, coming up, a former attorney to the president ducks a subpoena, and now the Democrats are renewing their calls for impeachment. We'll have the latest headlines from the CBN News Desk right after this. Welcome back to the 700 Club, a showdown between the administration and Democrats in Congress today. The White House, pursuing its policy of noncompliance with investigations on Capitol Hill, is openly defying a congressional subpoena. And as Jennifer Wishon reports, it could bring new calls for impeachment. On Capitol Hill today, a no-show. At the request of President Trump, former White House attorney Don McGahn said to defy a subpoena to testify before Congress on the Russia investigation. McGahn was a key witness in Mueller's report and offered Democrats believe the most damaging evidence of obstruction of justice against the president. The Justice Department issued an opinion saying Congress may not compel the president's senior advisors to testify about official duties. House Judiciary Committee Chairman Jerry Nadler is expected to hold McGahn in contempt. President Trump says the Mueller investigation is over. Now what happens is the Democrats want to redo, and we've had enough, and the country's had enough. Democrats are incensed. 
We have a president that is actively trying to cover up and prevent the American people from getting to the truth. And that's not something I think we can tolerate. Now, demands for impeachment among Democrats are growing louder. A number of leaders Monday night privately pressed Speaker Nancy Pelosi to begin an impeachment inquiry to attain the documents and testimony they're seeking. Speaker Pelosi has consistently rejected the idea, but Chairman Nadler says the president isn't above the law. Well, the recalcitrance of the president and his lawless behavior is making it more and more difficult to ignore all alternatives, including impeachment. Democrats calling for impeachment have found a friend in Republican Congressman Justin Amash. I think it's a process and it's something that uh, should be begun. The president dismisses his rogue colleague. Uh, he's been a loser for a long time rarely votes for Republicans, and, you know, personally, I think he's uh, not much. But a federal judge handed Democrats a victory Monday, upholding a congressional subpoena for the president's financial records from an accounting firm. The judge's opinion also makes clear Congress can investigate the president's conduct both before and after he took office. It is simply not fathomable that a constitution that grants Congress the power to remove a president for reasons including criminal behavior would deny Congress the power to investigate him, the judge writes. Using history as her guide, Pelosi fears impeachment proceedings against the president would be unpopular, causing voters to rally to his defense in 2020. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Washington. Thanks, Jennifer. And Pat, the White House is defending that this is all about presidential precedent. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been thinking so much about this. We have one president. He is in charge of foreign affairs. He's got to deal with Iran. He's got to deal with Russia. He's got to deal with China. He's got to deal with Venezuela and these other crises. Uh, he has to manage the budget of this great nation and to make sure we're spending the right direction. He's got to look after the poor and the needy, and you go down the line. Now, do we want the man in charge of all this to be distracted by continuous things like this nonsense of saying that his accountants have got to turn over 10 years of his business dealings to be shown to the public. Why would we want our president to have that, uh, that uh, burden? And as the attorney general said, I'm not just doing this for me, I'm doing it for the future presidency. We cannot allow this to get, and the Democrats keep saying, well, the American people want, the American people don't want any such thing. They don't want all these things. They don't want their president to be distracted. They want the president to do their business to make this country good for them. They don't want to have good for the Democrats. And the whole idea, for example, of that one district court judge, I have said it before, I say it again, Congress has the power to limit the jurisdiction of the lesser judiciary. They can set their terms. They can set everything they want to about them if they so desire. And I think it's long overdue that these district court judges be restricted merely to the geographical area where they serve and not try to, from their van point, uh, vantage point, that they would issue decrees that would affect the president and the whole United States of America. It can't be that way. It cannot be some judge in Hawaii it can't be determined on what we people in Virginia do. They just can't be doing that. And it's more, it's time. The Supreme Court could limit it. Justice Thomas has said it should be done. Others have said it. But it's got to be done. And furthermore, we've got to stop this business. If the American people don't turn on the Democrats, they should, because this stuff is terrible. We have one president. And if he's distracted, if he goes to war, he makes a mistake, he, we're all going to be in the, in the soup. And, and having Jerry Nadler and this bunch of Democrats saying, well, we've got to get all this information. Why? In, in support of some kind of legislative initiative, not a chance. They're not trying to pass some law. What they're trying to do is embarrass the president. Well, I, we, we, we've only got one president, folks, and the Bible says very clearly, a house divided against itself can stand. And if we continue this stuff, our country will be torn apart and nobody will be helped. We'll all be hurt. So these Democrats, they say, well, the American people want to know. The American people don't want to know any such thing. They want to get on with their lives and stop this squabbling in Washington. Well, 
terrible weather has ripped parts of the nation, and John has that. That's right, Pat. Tornado warnings are in effect today for parts of the Midwest. Just this morning, a twister was spotted near the Tulsa airport. Monday, at least 17 tornadoes, two spinning side by side, seen here in Oklahoma, forcing residents to take cover. With the tornadoes came flood level rains, destroying homes and property. Emergency workers were out all night rescuing people from their homes and cars. And for some parts of the nation, winter still hasn't gone. Parts of Minnesota getting a dusting of snow earlier this week. While a growing number of Americans believe socialism would be good for the country. Though a recent Gallup survey shows most Americans, 51% still believe socialism would be a bad thing, 43% say it would be good. That's up from 25% in 1942. Previous studies show the definition of socialism is changing among Americans, nearly one in four associating it with social equality, while 17 percent understand it involves government control over the means of production. As of 2018, a majority of Democrats, 57 percent, see socialism positively. Well, an escalating war of words between President Trump and Iran. Many Middle East experts say it's unlikely real hostilities will break out, but the situation does raise the question, just how strong is Iran's military? CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell offers us some answers. President Trump fired the latest salvo in the war of words. We have no indication that uh, anything's happened or will happen, but if it does, it will be met, obviously, with great force. We'll have no choice. An Iranian general fired back and tweeted, we will give a crushing response to any aggression by our enemies. But are Iranian military threats like these credible or just bluster? Conventionally, Iran is actually quite weak. The reason the Islamic Republic of Iran has posed a threat to U.S. interests in the Middle East and to allied security in the Middle East for so long is because it is an asymmetric military powerhouse. Iranian expert Ben Nam Talablu says Iran uses asymmetrical warfare through terrorism, proxies and intimidation. Bloviating hyperbole are actually core elements of Iran's security policy. Why? Again, because the Islamic Republic of Iran is hypercognizant of its own conventional military deficiencies. And when Iran knows it can't win the battle of capabilities, it looks to win the battle of resolve. Middle East expert Jonathan Spire says Iran's strength lies in its proxies throughout the region, like the Palestinian Islamic Jihad that recently launched hundreds of missiles into Israel. They have this array of political military organizations, many Hezbollahs, so to speak, of which Lebanese Hezbollah was the prototype across the region. Very committed, very well indoctrinated, very, sometimes well trained young men who are available, non Iranians for the most part, who are available for military tasks. One flashpoint for Iran's asymmetric warfare is the capability to close the Strait of Hormuz, where much of the world's oil passes through just off the coast of Iran. It's exceptionally vulnerable. However, Iran doesn't have the capability to keep the strait closed. It has the ability to block it, and the U.S., through overwhelming military uh, superiority, could open it. The one military arena Iran holds an edge is its ballistic missile program. This is, again, an exceptionally important area because multiple U.S. directors of national intelligence have said that Iran has the largest arsenal of ballistic missiles in the entire Middle East. Given its strengths and weaknesses, Iran balances its hot rhetoric with cool, calculated geopolitical moves that make it a formidable adversary in the most dangerous region of the world. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Thanks, Chris and Pat. The escalating war of words has many people in the region and around the world on edge. I think the president said it right. He doesn't want war. None of us want war. But I tell you, we also don't want bullies, and, and Iran is just a bully. They're, and apparently it's, it's a lot of uh, hot air that's coming out, but at the same time, they do have ballistic missiles. And if they ever get atomic weapons, heaven help us, because they have indicated clearly they won't hesitate to use them against Israel, or if they can reach us, they use them against our forces uh, in other parts of the, of the world, especially they can reach Europe with some of these ballistic missiles. So uh, we don't count it out and say it's just bluster. They lost a million men in that Iraq-Iran war, and they don't hesitate to lose, use young men as cannon fodder. Uh, it's a brutal situation, but that's the way it is. And theologically, theologically, the ruling mullahs believe in the so-called Mahdi, 
And who's the Mahdi? Well, he's the, the last ayatollah, the, the, the last imam. <clears throat> and he's going to come at the end of terror, and he will restore the world. So they believe that if they can create terror in the world, the Mahdi will put it down and settle it. And if you have that kind of fanaticism in your uh, makeup, there's no limit to what you might uh, try to accomplish. Terry? Well, up next, a mother who was popping pills to numb her back pain and then later to numb the pain of everything else. I was just a walking shell. I was very disconnected emotionally because I had got to the point to where like I was spiritually dead because they had taken over my life. Find out how she got her life back when we return. Have you heard about opioids? Have you heard about uh, hydrocodone, oxycontin, these pills that have been shoved out to the pharmaceutical companies to millions in America. And America's addiction to those pain pills has now reached an epidemic level. Keel Wallers was also one of its victims. After getting a prescription for pain meds, Keel was hooked. And it wasn't long before those drugs cost her her home, her family, her freedom, and almost her life. It was an afternoon. A friend and I were actually traveling from Pittsburgh. We just hit an icy spot. She lost control, and within seconds, we were in a ditch. We were actually able to walk away, um, but it was later on that day I realized that, you know, some pain had set in. The back pain would only get worse for Kia Waller, the wife and mother of three young girls. After a couple of months, a doctor prescribed powerful painkillers. It took the pain away, but I also realized that it was um, doing something else. It was taking away worry, things that I didn't realize that, you know, was going on deep inside. One of those things happened when she was just 10. Her father suddenly died of heart failure, and to her, his absence meant the loss of love and security. I'm actually the one who found him. And um, my main focus was making sure my mom was okay, making sure my siblings was okay. You know, I didn't know how to mourn. I was a kid. Then shortly after, her mom told Kia that the man she had called dad all her life was not her real father. Her biological dad abandoned them before she was born. Kia believed that the reason he left was because she wasn't worth staying for. I had just stuffed that pain that I had went through um, that day, because it was traumatic. Kia continued to bury that pain as she grew into adulthood, trying hard to appear as if everything were fine. I was a wife, a mother of three children, worked full time, went to church every Sunday, living a normal life. Kia was 29 when she and her friend had their accident, leaving her with daily back pain. The meds not only relieved that pain, but the years of hurt she had long since buried. Within two weeks of taking pain medication, I remember wanting to take another one before I was supposed to. After her prescription ran out, Kia bought her pain meds on the street. Still able to function, she managed to hide her drug abuse for a long time, even from her husband, Orlando. But inside, she was dying. I was just a walking shell. I was very disconnected emotionally because I had got to the point to where like I was spiritually dead because they had taken over my life. When she could no longer hide her addiction, Kia confessed everything to the one person she knew would hold her accountable, her mother-in-law, Sonia. I was a crack addict. When you've walked it, you know what that monster looks like. I felt that she needed to go to detox, rehab, and then a halfway house. She kept telling me, no, 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 because her family needed her. She was the only person that gave me that tough love I needed. I couldn't stand her. I couldn't. Sonia convinced her daughter-in-law to try rehab, but Kia's addiction raged on. In the coming years, she went to jail multiple times on DUI and drug charges, followed by more stints in rehab. 
Orlando tried everything to help his wife, but even threatening to take the girls and leave didn't work. I was carrying so much guilt that every time I would go to rehab or go to jail, I would get out and I still had the guilt and shame. So that's why I would use. Even though she had professed faith in God when she was younger, Kia came to believe she wasn't even worth his help. He was there because there was many times where I should have died. He never left me, I left him. I felt spiritually dead. Finally, in 2013, Orlando made good on his threat to leave. I came home and they were gone. I hated myself, I wanted to die, but I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop. It was then Kia turned to heroin and crack, but after several months, she finally hit bottom. I'm done. And I dropped to my knees, literally. And I just threw my hands up, cried out to God. It was like anything but death, help me. I can't do this myself. I don't know how to stop. I meant it. I meant it. Hours later, she was arrested and back in jail. I said, all right, God, whatever we got to do so I don't have to live the way I've been living anymore, I I'm willing to do it. While in prison, Kia looked to Jesus and his word for truth and healing. She also went through a long-term addiction program. It was the best thing that ever could have happened to me. My life changed. That's where I really dealt with those childhood issues. The guilt and the shame that I had acquired over the years of active addiction, not just to myself, but to my family. And at that point, that the chains were broken and the hope was alive. After 14 months, Kia got out, found a church, and joined a 12-step support group. God slowly, totally took it away from me, and I was about four months in, and that obsession was lifted. These days, her marriage and family are fully restored. Kia now manages a women's sober living home and pours into them what she's learned about true worth and God's power. I definitely felt the love of God. Ask him for help and he will help you. You can change, it's so possible. It should be dead. But God said, uh-uh, I got a plan for this one. And boy, has he showed off and I know he's not done. He's got a plan. You know, God has a plan for you. Plan to do you good and not harm. Plan to lift you up and make you his own. God has a plan. But I tell you, this opioid thing's terrible. And there has to be, uh, in most of cases, uh, you can't just go cold turkey. You've got to have some intermediate step. But uh, whatever it is, the power of God is able to set you free. God is able to set you free. And what you need to do is to trust him and call on him. As far as opioids, oxycontin and hydrocodone and these other uh, opioids of that nature, uh, the coming down situation is much harder than it is from heroin or cocaine or any other type of drug, crack and so forth. Uh, the other is terrible, but this is awful. You can't get out of it unless there is some letdown. But God Almighty can make a difference in your life. And Kia found that difference, and she's free. Her life was ruined, and God took the ruin, the ashes of despair and defeat, and made something beautiful. And the idea is that God can make something beautiful out of your life. And you say, no, no, you don't understand. I've sent away the chances. I'm, I'm, I'm too rotten. I can't do it. God says, no, I can make out of you something beautiful. Just turn it over to me and let me try. Let me do it. Turn it over to me. Stop trying and give it over to God. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, has he saved us. But by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself is a gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. If you want to know the Lord, pray with me right now. Lord, you know the mess I've made in my life. You know what is taking control of me. Lord, I pray that you will set me free. I renounce the things that I have done, 
and I turn to you, and I need your help, God. Please, Lord, hear me now. Set me free from the bondage that has come into my heart. In the name of Jesus, do a miracle, we, I pray, in my life. I'm yours from this moment on. Lord Jesus, come and take over my life. I give myself to you, and I'm trusting you for the answer. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed with me, I want to help you start, get going. You know, it's not, I'm not going to throw you just off by yourself. This is something that will help you. It's called a new day, and I've had it for some time. But in here is a, is a compact disc, 73 minutes of intense teaching on what it is that God has for you and what he's done for you. I'll give it to you free. Just pick up the phone, call in, 1-800-700-7000. It's an easy number to remember, and it's toll free. No money. We're not talking about anything financial. We're just talking about I want to bless you. And I, God wants to bless you and give you a future and a hope. Terry? Still ahead, a family's fight through cancer, infertility, and holding on to hope in the battle of their lives. Josh and Allie Taylor of TLC's Rattle join us live, so don't go away. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. A South Texas church began a new chapter Sunday, 18 months after a gunman killed more than two dozen of its members. Church leaders and the congregation gathered at First Baptist Church in Sutherland Springs for its dedication and grand opening with Texas Governor Greg Abbott delivering remarks. The new worship center and education building includes a memorial honoring the victims of the shooting. Well, students at Morehouse College received the perfect graduation present, a debt-free start. Billionaire philanthropist Robert F. Smith told the 400 graduates at the historically black college that he would pay off all of their student loans. The estimated cost of that gift? $40 million. Smith encouraged the class of 19, uh, 2019 to pay it forward. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. People have a date in mind when they think of a day changed that changed their lives. Well, usually it's a wedding anniversary or the birth of a child. For Josh and Allie Taylor, that date is October 17th, 2011. Everything is measured as something that happened before that day or after. That's because on October 17th, their life stopped and their worst nightmare began. In October of 2011, Allie Taylor was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 24. She underwent years of treatments and surgeries, and everything she and her husband Josh dreamed of came to a screeching halt. The chemo left Allie unable to have children, so they decided to adopt. Nine months later, Allie got pregnant. I can see, but I'm pregnant, and I've never seen this before, and I don't know if it's real. 11 days after their baby was born, they adopted another little girl. Josh and Allie's story was featured in TLC's Rattled, and they continue to share their remarkable journey in their book, Allie's Fight. Allie and Josh Taylor are here with us now, and we welcome you to the 700 Club. It's great to see you both. Thank you. You guys don't do anything normally. No. <laughs> I mean, I'm reading your book into the wee hours, and I am exhausted <laughs> just walking through yeah. it. Talk a little bit about that day that I mentioned, October 17th, mm -hmm. 2011. It was the day that changed your life plan. Yeah. What totally. happened? Um, so that was the day I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I'm a big planner. I had my entire life planned out from the time I was married and when I wanted to have kids. And on that day, that was all thrown out the window. Um, we were, we had been told that it wasn't cancer. And so we thought, okay, now we can get on with our lives. We were starting to try to have a baby. And, um, that day our life truly stopped. What was your life plan, Josh, before this? <laughs> well, Allie had a really long life plan. Mine, mine was a little more immediate. Uh, but we were building we were building a brand new house. I'm a contractor, and so we were building our, our first house for us. And uh, we were actually in a bedroom. We had talked about 
how we were going to tell our parents we were pregnant by painting on the wall. And so, I mean, we're there <laughs> prepping for the painters to come. And that's when Allie got a call from the doctor that um, we weren't pregnant, that Allie had breast cancer. And so and our life plan changed real fast. And not just had breast cancer, a very aggressive mm -hmm. form yes. of breast cancer. And I mean, from that point on, it seemed like it was just one bad piece of news after another. Yes. Without your faith, I'm not sure how you would have survived that. Yeah, I don't know how people do. Mm -mm. I don't know how people do because it was, you're right, it was one bad piece. I was diagnosed with stage three breast cancer, the most aggressive type that you could have. Um, we learned we wouldn't have time to preserve our fertility. We learned that it had spread. And so it was kind of one bad piece after another. And I remember looking at Josh saying, how do people do this without Jesus? Yeah. I, I don't Josh, know. Josh, you say that the cancer changed you as well. Mm -hmm. In what way? in too many ways. To, we don't have that much time, but mainly just a, um, I grew up believing I could change it. That what, I, what we tell people is that was the first time I ever ran into anything that money, time, or talent would not change. And then, you know, no amount of money I could make could heal her, no time I could give her, no talent. There was nothing I could do. And for a guy, even at 26, 27, at that point, that was a rough moment to come to, to realize I was, she didn't need anything but me to beg God yeah. to reach down and heal her. And that's what you did day after day after day. I mean, I, I, I was struck by the fact that this was so not what you had in the mm -hmm. game plan. I mean, you guys were really newlyweds at this yes. point, incredibly young. Uh, you know, the chemotherapy came first. You had a double mastectomy, chemotherapy, radiation, and then the struggle with infertility. Did you, I mean, how did you hang on to hope in that, Allie? Yeah, I think I had to just believe. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that sounds very um, elementary to say, mm -hmm. just believe, but I just had to believe. We, When I was diagnosed um, and told we didn't have time to preserve my fertility, we really held on to this one verse. It's Psalm 128, and it says, your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your home, and your children will be like olive shoots around your table. This is the blessing for the man who fears the Lord. And that's mm -hmm. what we stood on, that I would be a fruitful vine, that I would live, that we would have children. So I think it was just literally taking God's word at its word. <laughs> well, and sometimes you really stood your ground with that because doctors, right. nurses, friends, I'm sure sometimes unwittingly family would often come into that with either sort of a wake up and smell the coffee <laughs> scenario time. or just bringing a word that was negative. And I mean, you kind of that's right. Said, Stop right there. How'd yeah. you handle that? We just, we found, we were about three days into MD Anderson when we finally looked at the doctor and said, we really don't care about your statistics. We want to know your wisdom. We, we believe God's given you wisdom and that's, we're going to act on that. But as far as your statistics, we're not dependent on them anyway. Mm -hmm. And so, and they do nothing but really tear your faith down. And so we so tell me about your first miracle, Gen oh, Genevieve, Genevieve, right? That's yeah. right, yes. She was born, we adopted her um, in March of 2015, and it was the first time that cancer kind of made sense. Um, we always said, had I not been diagnosed, we would have never been brought to her. And so it was that moment of, okay, God, I see the beauty from ashes, you know, that this beautiful daughter. And so we had her, um, but a lot like most, a lot like a lot of adoptions do, um, we almost lost her. Yeah. The birth mom um, considered trying to keep her and that was- At the last, I mean, after cancer. you had been there, yes. been in the birth. Yeah, I mean- There's So much of that too is what we tell people is, that's the moment where like, we're supposed to show a different kind of love. Yeah. We loved her when she was doing what we, what she, in her perception, we wanted her to do. Mm -hmm. Well, it's what you do in that moment when she's not doing what, when she knows that she's breaking your heart, well, you still love her. And the truth, that's what we did. We just stayed there with her, no matter what her decision was. And obviously in the end, God, God did step in and mm -hmm. we became the parents of Genevieve, but. So Genevieve came home with you and then at, around Thanksgiving, you started feeling ill. Yes not long after Genevieve. Right. And what happened? <laughs> well, I thought I was having a infection in my arm. I was having an, an infection. A lot of times um, I have flu-like symptoms with that. It's a side effect of some of my breast cancer treatment. So I, I chalked it up to that. I had one little paper pregnancy test. 
that I took felt Out silly uh, yeah, <laughs> over the years, <laughs> you know, I bought in bulk on Amazon. And so, but I had one left. I thought this is silly for even taking it. Doctors told us that this was impossible and came back and saw two lines and thought, what in the world? And I was pregnant and not only was I pregnant, but I went and saw the doctor. She said it wasn't even a high risk pregnancy. It was as if I had just gotten pregnant miraculously. And along came Vera. That's right. That's our Vera. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And even before you delivered Vera, you sure. got a strange call from Genevieve's mother. Well, the grandmother called you and the lawyer called you and you, you must have wondered what in the world are they calling now <laughs> for? So yes. what happened? Yes. They, they call and say, we know Allie's pregnant, but uh, I'm pregnant. Would you guys consider adopting? And we honestly wanted to say right then, yes, but we said, Let it, give us a few days, we're going to pray. And then we, we obviously did say yes and then started making plans to be able to be at the birth of uh, that second little baby too. And, and home came Lydia. Lydia. That's right. <laughs> right. Yes, there's Lydia. So she was born 11 days after Vera. And so we, people always say, how did you say yes so quickly? And, you know, to us, to be told at one point we wouldn't be parents and now be the opportunity to have three little blessings. So right now your girls are how old? Our oldest is four, Genevieve's four, and then Vera and Lydia are two and a half. Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> yes, unbelievable. It's very quiet at our house. Very, oh, very I'll quiet. bet. And lots of sleep. Uh -huh. Yeah, That's yeah, right. then they're done that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know say, all about that. We are skimming the surface of this couple's story. It's so worth the read. There's nobody that's going through a tough time that can't gain something spiritually from reading the Taylor, Taylor's book as well as just know you're not alone. You're not the only one. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's the way life makes you feel. It's called Allie's Fight, Beating Cancer, Battling Infertility, Believing in Miracles. It's in stores nationwide. Highly recommend it. Great to have you here. Thanks, Thanks for, having, so us. for Thanks. having us. What a story. Wow. Well, coming up next, we've got time for your questions and some honest answers. Kathy asks this, why didn't God create man without a free will so he wouldn't sin? Seems like a good idea, maybe. Pat tackles that more. Don't go away. for your questions and some honest answers. Pat, Kathy says, don't you think it would have been better for God to have created man without a free will? That way man could not have ever sinned. Oh, let me ask you, I, I've got four children and uh, we just had a story about some people had little children. Would you want your child to be an automaton who had to do the right thing. Would you rather have a little kid who voluntarily threw his arms around you and kissed you and, and you know, despite their, they could do whatever they wanted to do, but they grew up and they loved you because they wanted to love you, not because they were made that way? Well, I, yeah, that's the answer to your question. God didn't want a bunch of automatons who, he wanted people like us who are free and freely love him. And I love the Lord and it's free. I, and I'm not forced to do it and it isn't because it's in my makeup, it's because I have a free will and I freely choose to serve the Lord. That's important. All right. This is Esther who says, is it right to take communion at home alone? I hear some people are doing that every day. What is your advice about this? Is it biblical? Um, I, I think so. Uh, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, if you can't come to church, you, you really you know, you don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. It's important to come in a communion with uh, other people. But if you're alone and, and you want communion, I see nothing wrong with that. This is Robert who says, my wife passed away a few months ago from stage four cancer. She had great faith in the Lord. I don't understand why she wasn't healed. The Bible states, by his stripes, we are healed. She was such a beautiful person inside and out, always helping people that were in need. Thank you for your answer. Uh, you know, cancer is is like a, a, a presence that comes on people. I've been at the bedside of godly people and prayed, and the cancer overwhelmed them. Uh, there's so many factors now in cancer. We had a doctor talking about the, the answer to cancer, and uh, it overwhelms people. and. I don't know the answer. I really would like to give you an answer because I, I, I don't have it. Uh, but uh, I do know that 
their treatments. I mean, I had cancer. I had, and I, I said, get it out of me. It was prostate cancer, and I got rid of it. And they, they, you know, took it out. My wife had breast cancer. She had a mastectomy, and we're still living, and everything's good. But uh, I, I don't have the answer about that. Uh, for your loved one, uh, I, I've seen, I've been at the bedside of people who've been dying of cancer and somehow it overwhelms them. And I, I don't know the answer. I really don't. But I, I think that the truth of God still stands firm. All right. Bruce wants to know if it's a sin as a Christian to eat pork. Uh, heavens no. Um, we were freed from those dietary restrictions. Jesus said, uh, he, he said, all foods are clean. Uh, he, he, he made that statement. He said, what comes out of your heart is what defiles you, not what comes into your stomach. And, you know, the thing about pork is, the, the, you know, they have strychnosis and all this other stuff. So the pork's got to be cooked carefully. If it's not, you might get some uh, worm that wouldn't do you any good, but it's not a sin. Today's power medicine from the book of Jeremiah. I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. Thanks so much for being with us. For Terry and me, this is Pat Robertson, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. God bless you. Bye-bye.